introduce uh, Simon Scott. Well, first myself, I'm Robin Davies, the Associate Director of the Development Policy Centre. Um, this is a, a pretty good turnout. Simon was worried that this stunningly boring topic might not attract people, but I've, I've told him that actually the, uh, the scope and definition of ODA is pretty topical in Australia at the moment for a whole range of reasons, and I'm sure there might be some questions about that. Um, I won't say a lot. I've worked with Simon at Aussie in the past and uh, in Paris uh, when I was on the, the DAC. Um, I did a lot in relation to the statistics working party that Simon was involved in. Not so much in relation to the tracking of financial flows, reasonably interesting, but much more in relation to the normative function um, of the DAC uh, in relation to the ODA definition. And I, I, I think that's you know really the heart of the matter and what, what Simon will be talking about today. So I'll hand over to Simon. He'll, he'll speak for, I guess, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have around 20 minutes of Q&A afterwards. Well, thanks very much, Robin. It's a pleasure to be back in my... Uh, alma mater after nearly 35 years, uh, and this time behind the lectern and with an opportunity to infect young minds. Um, I've called my talk, Does ODA, Official Development Assistance, Have a Future? And I plan to address two specific issues under this heading. First of all, where ODA levels are headed and secondly, whether the ODA concept is likely to survive, and if not, what might replace it. Now, a lot of people wonder why the OECD is involved in this, why the UN is not uh, collecting the data or some other body, and that goes back to this resolution on the common aid effort. And what happened was, at the end of the... Marshall Plan, the United States wanted to get the European countries that had recovered after the war to uh, participate in foreign aid. The United States was really the only substantial donor around 1960, and they convened this development assistance group, which met four or five times in Paris, Washington, Tokyo, and London, and which eventually issued this sort of manifesto for themselves with three objectives, which I've highlighted there. Expand the total volume of resources going to developing countries and approve their effectiveness. Uh, expand aid, grants or loans on favourable terms, and review together the amount and the content of aid programmes. And these three um, objectives of the DAC remain today. And all of them require decent statistics if they're to be done properly. And that need was met almost immediately by this man, uh, Angus Madison, uh, a great economic historian and the first secretary of the Development Assistance Group. Now, Madison worked uh, all over the world studying Western economies, communist economies, developing economies. He wrote several books, and at the end of his career, mostly after retirement, he conducted a monumental research exercise to estimate global, regional, and country GDP for the last 2,000 years. And his figures are used everywhere where you see uh, comparisons of economic output in different uh, centuries. But in a few weeks in 1961, he prepared the first reliable figures on the flow of resources to developing countries. And they were in this little book. Uh, you see down the bottom there, it still has the logo of the OEEC, the Organisation for European Economic Cooperation, which still existed at that point, the Marshall Plan not having formally wound up. But just about at this time, the OEEC uh, was finished off and the OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, replaced it. And the OECD... Uh, decided that it would swallow the Development Assistance Group and that group would become a standing committee of the OECD, the Development Assistance Committee. 
<coughs> now, here is a picture of three men in blue ties, just as prophesied. Uh, we couldn't get away with that these days unless we had at least 11 women also in the picture somewhere. Um, the man in the middle looking visionary and uh, rather pleased with himself as the OECD Secretary General, who has just got the DAC under his wing. The man on the left who doesn't seem amused and is perhaps consulting his Blackberry or whatever they had in 1960 is the chair of the DAC, uh, James Riddleberger. And the man on the right uh, attempting to conceal his blue tie is the Deputy Secretary General responsible for uh, development. Um, now, I won't go into DAC history now that I've given you the first five minutes of it, uh, except to say that for the last 50 years, the OECD has continued Madison's work of compiling figures on the resource flow to developing countries. Now, I want to get on to the story of ODA, which begins here. Now, not a lot of people know this pub quiz question, but this is the uh, uh, beach at... Nuborg Strand on the island of Foon in Denmark. And if you turned around, you'd see this, the Nuborg Strand Hotel, built in 1920, and it was here in August 1958 that the World Council of Churches first proposed a target for foreign aid. Now, here's an extract from the document that does this, uh, <coughs> very redolent of the times, as you see, critical state of the struggle to accelerate economic and social development, mankind stirred by new hopes and quickening change, the people should see the hand of God in this revolutionary situation, and so on. And uh, by the way, uh, how about a bit of cash? Uh, the cleric's suggestion is that at least 1% of national income of countries should be devoted to foreign aid. Now, this proposal at the bottom there found its way into the UN system and it rattled around in there for about three years and it came out in 1961 as a 1% target but for total net resource flows to developing countries. And that meant it included private investment. And the inclusion of private investment made the target easier to meet but impossible to target because governments don't control the flow of private investment. Now, a few years later, this watering down of the Divine's plan for a 1% uh, transfer was picked up by the Group of 77, a block of developing countries that had formed at the first meeting of the UN Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva in 1964. In 1967, they had their first ministerial meeting in Algiers and they called for a separate minimum target within the 1% target covering only official aid and net of amortisation and interest. Now again this proposal found its way into the UN system and it rattled around in there again for three years and it came out the other end as the famous UN target for ODA of 0.7%, which the UN General Assembly agreed on the 24th of October 1970. But uh, just as with the earlier target, there was a little bit of a glitch that made it easier to meet. Uh, the 0.7% target for ODA is net of amortisation, but it's not net of interest payments. So this made the 0.7 target just a little bit easier to get to. Um, let me see where I'm up to. Yes. Now, the adoption of the 0.7% target, even though a little watered down, did seem to have an effect. Here's the flow of ODA. The 60s has been recalculated. ODA didn't really exist as a concept then. Um, but the flow of ODA from 1960 to 2012, and you see that in the 60s, the red line is falling very sharply. That's the ODA to GNI ratio of the DAC countries. The actual amount in real dollars was roughly steady. That's the blue line. 
but since the economies of the donor countries were growing so fast, the aid as a share of national output was falling. But 1970, you see the trend changes. For the next 20 years, the 70s and 80s, the trend in ODA GNI is roughly flat and the trend in real dollars is going up. And that goes, continues up to about 1990 and then you notice the red line dropping off increasingly sharply with the end of the Cold War and the recession in donor countries in the early 90s. And it wobbles along the bottom for a while and then around 2000 with the Millennium Development Goals and 2002 with the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development, aid starts to pick up again. So that's the trend. Here's the trend just in more recent years. It's uh, perhaps better to consider leaving off the green at the top if you're looking for the trend because the green is debt forgiveness and debt forgiveness fluctuates a lot. And if you do that, you see that aid was going up fairly steadily but appears to have peaked around 2009-10 and is coming down again with the economic recession biting on uh, aid budgets. Now the question is whether this recent fall is going to continue or not. And one clue to that would be what happened last time. Here's a graph I did many years ago about what happened in the 1990s recession. And the countries on the left are the ones with the biggest deficits in 1993, the bottom of the early 90s recession. The countries on the right are the ones with the smallest deficits in 1993. And you see what happened. The one with the biggest deficit cut their aid very substantially. And the uh, ones on the right were able to increase their aid because they didn't have a large deficit. Now, Sweden may look to be a bit of an exception here, and Norway also doesn't move much in the second graph. But you've got to remember that those two countries fix their aid as a share of their GNP. So whatever their deficit was, it wasn't going to react much on aid flows. But the other countries did not have a fixed target for ODA, and you see there that their response in ODA level is an exaggeration of their deficit position. Italy and Finland on the left had large deficits and cut their aid by an even larger amount. Japan and Ireland on the right had very small deficits and managed to increase their aid substantially. So the impact on ODA is a magnification of the overall fiscal position of countries. Now, what might happen this time? This is a graph that was presented recently by our chief economist at the ministerial meeting, which shows on the red bars the total amount of <coughs> consolidation, i.e. reduction in the deficit, required to stabilise the debt of countries by 2030. And the blue bars are the amount of deficit reduction already achieved since 2010 or planned for 2014. So the chief economist made the point that quite a lot of the work is done. Now, does this mean that uh, aid might escape further large cuts? Well, maybe not, because if you look at the individual countries here, you find the second country is Japan. There's still a huge gap there. The fourth country is the United States. That still has quite a large gap. And the seventh country, UK, GBR here, a very large gap. Now, those countries have a big debt to make up. And also remember that the blue bars include planned deficit reductions in 2014. Uh, now, we have some Treasury people here who can probably tell us that not all planned deficit reductions come off as planned. So these blue bars may not be quite as high up the red ones as they are now when the numbers come in at the end of 2014. Now, you might think that the European countries, other than the Great Britain, uh, don't have much of a gap on that previous uh, slide and therefore that they mightn't be cutting their aid all that much. But I don't think that's right either, because here we have a, a graph, 
which shows the uh, deficit as the gap between revenue and expenditure. Expenditure is the top line and revenue is the bottom, unlike in the legend. Uh, and you see that the deficit opened up substantially in 29 and was still large in 2010 and is now being reduced, but mainly because the revenue line, the blue line, is coming back to trend. Now, that's not going to be enough to stabilise the debt levels of countries. Revenue is going to have to exceed expenditure for quite a few years to get those debt levels down. And this has consistently not happened in the past in these EU countries. And that means that despite the fact that there have already been substantial cuts in southern Europe and there's a lot of talk of austerity generally in Europe, this expenditure line at the top is going to have to come down if the revenue line is ever to exceed it. All in all, I would say aid is in for something of a hammering. The EU countries are going to have great difficulty in meeting their 0.7% target, which they've set for themselves by 2015. And the fact that they are going to fall short, almost certainly, means that it will be unlikely for aid targets to be as prominent or as frequent in future, aid targets for after 2015. Now, Australia may be an exception, it already has a target for after 2015, but very few other countries do, except the ones that already meet 0.7 and always have done. But the other countries, most EU countries, unlikely to have a demanding odour target after 2015. Now, cynics might suggest that uh, when the numbers look bad, governments change the measurements. But I want you to put that quite out of your mind as you consider this slide, which deals with possible new measurements. Uh, the 2012 DAC high-level meeting made quite a few decisions, and among them were these two about how aid and other resource flows are to be counted. The first one, they suggested there should be a new measure of total official support for development. And the second one, clean up odour, modernise the odour concept and make sure that there is a clear quantitative definition of concessional in character, which is one of the requirements for an expenditure to be counted as odour. And there's been a lot of debate about that, which we'll get onto in a minute. But let's uh, just very briefly have a look at the first blob uh, the possible new measure of total official support for development. There are a lot of new financial instruments out there, not all of which qualify as aid. Here's the total picture of resources for development as collected by the DAC at the moment, divided into concessional and non-concessional, official and private. Concessional means giving something of value away. Not necessarily a grant, but you must give something of value away. Now, the simplest method of meeting the DAC high level meetings idea of a new measure for official support for development would be to add the top two uh, boxes together. That was what was done in the 60s before the ODA concept came along. But in practice, I think uh, we're going to find that the new measure is both wider and narrower than the sum of those two boxes. It will be wider because those two boxes are generally shown net, that's net of repayments on loans, and it doesn't make sense to show the other official flows net because over the long run they're not concessional, so they'll be zero anyway. So the new measure will probably be shown gross, that is just with the outflows not taking off the reflows, but it's also likely to be narrower than the sum of the two because it will leave out the export credits and other commercially motivated flows. It will only count the developmentally motivated flows in the non-concessional column. Development loans given by development banks for development purposes. So that's all I wanted to say about the possible new measure of total official flows for development. <coughs> and we'll move on to the second important point, last important point, which is the definition of odour. How might this uh, change in future? Well, 
first of all, we need to go back to what odour is. Uh, to be counted as odour, the flow must meet four criteria. It must be to a developing country. It must be from an official source. It must be for economic development and welfare. And it must be concessional in character and convey a grant element of at least 25%. Now, that is a mathematical formula. I won't go into it, but it uh, compares a loan with a loan at 10% interest rate, and if it's sufficiently below that, then it can count as ODA. And a lot of people say, well, the ODA definition has been watered down, but at least in a technical sense, that's not true at all. These words are exactly as they were in 1972, and all the arguments have been about whether an individual expenditure, a new item, meets those four criteria, all of them, or not. Uh, and the argument is that a lot of items led into ODA over the years, critics think, don't meet one, at least, of those four criteria. Not so much the official. Usually it's fairly clear what's official, and, of course, it's always clear whether a loan meets the grant element test. It's just a formula. But the other things, whether a country is truly developing, whether the flow has a developmental motive, and whether it's concessional in character, those are all debated in individual cases. Now, here we have examples of what is contested, what our odour items are contested. Um, my old boss used to call this the rubbish heap, and that uh, <laughs> since we're in a formal setting here, I've put them out in chronological order and uh, call them the annals of shonk. Uh, <laughs> so some of them, though, are easier to justify than others. Um, if there weren't any administrative costs, there wouldn't be any aid programs. Uh, the overpriced technical experts down the bottom, that's a bit hard to say who's overpriced. It varies a lot. I looked into this about 10 years ago and I uh, found that the British technical experts were not paid all that much. The UN ones were paid better. And some Australian secondes in Papua New Guinea were among the highest cost officials in the world. But let's just leave out them and have a look at, no, let's just first of all have a look at how much aid could be reduced if all these items and other contested items were taken out. Here's a graph put out by the pressure group Action Aid a couple of years ago and everything they didn't like they called substandard aid. And you can see substandard aids on the top, and it's a lot. It's almost half of ODA. Now, they included other things as well, things like uh, aid that was rated not very effective by the recipients, and aid to middle-income countries that they thought didn't deserve it, and so on. But if you want to get really purist about it, aid flows can come down an awful lot. But, yes, let's get back to look at the three most contested items. The in-donor refugee costs, the implicit student subsidies, and the unsubsidised loans, which is really the first part of a two-part problem with debt forgiveness. We'll come to that in a minute. The in-donor refugee costs refer to the fact that since the early 1980s, donors have been able to count the costs of so-called temporary sustenance of a refugee arriving in a developed country, in a donor country. And the logic behind that was it may be temporary and these people may then go home and make a developmental contribution and therefore their temporary sustenance, even in a developed country, could be counted as ODA. The counter-argument is most of them don't go home, so why is this in there? Um, now, the, this is one of the few items where the DAC secretariat, the OECD staff have had a view. My old director thought that this shouldn't be in ODA. He campaigned, we put up several proposals, so also did several members of the DAC to get rid of this item. Uh, but all attempts to get rid of it have failed. Uh, we're very transparent about it. We have uh, this 
document which goes into the whole sorry tale, and we have another document which gives the exact amounts that each donor is counting under this item and how it is worked out, which is very different and very inconsistent between members. And uh, Australia will shortly be making a much anticipated addition to that list of country uh, procedures for working out the in-donor refugee costs, won't they, Robin? Uh, now, the second of the dodgy brothers uh, is the um, imputed student costs, and those are down to this man, Laurie Corkery, a, um, a former Australian ambassador to Singapore and also to Switzerland and Austria. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, and in 1984, Laurie was a first assistant secretary in ADAB when the then minister, Bill Hayden, decided that the gap between the fees that overseas students paid and the full cost of their tuition should be counted as ODA. Now, the minister was advised that this would require a change in DAC rules, and he deputed Laurie to go to the DAC in Paris and argue for that change. And it wasn't all that easy for Laurie to uh, get this to happen, even though the other donor countries, many of them, had uh, low or no cost fees for foreign students and would also benefit, same as Australia. But it took a couple of years of uh, hemming and hawing in the DAC before they agreed to count this item as ODA. And there were a few fig leaves attached in the end about the students had to you would be... Uh, you had to be assured that the students would go home, uh, they had to be studying developmentally relevant courses, and uh, the whole thing had to be part of a conscious policy of development cooperation. Um, anyhow, Laurie delivered, and Australia was able to count this gap between the fees and the real cost, but it really didn't amount to very much for Australia because it was only three or four years later that Australia decided to up the fees for foreign students to full cost fees anyway. The gap disappeared, there were no longer any implicit costs, so Australia hasn't been counting anything under this item for 20 years, whereas the European countries that hummed and hawed are now counting still 5 or 10% of their ODA comes in these imputed student costs. Uh, now, whew, I'm tired already, but I have to tell you about the unsubsidised loans, the last important and uh, probably the largest uh, problem area in the uh, ODA measurement today. Uh, now, this slide explains it fairly clearly, what's been happening. Development banks of France, Germany and the EU, last two or three years, can raise funds at around 2%. Issue bonds, they only have to pay 2% on the bonds. That may be about to change. The bond market is tightening up, but the last few years they've been able to do that. They then relend this money at developing countries at 3 to 5%, and if the maturity, that's the term of the loan, is long enough, the loans meet this grant element test, because they're getting a uh, it's worked out against a 10% interest rate, and if you have 5% interest rate for more than about 15 years, then bingo, you get the 25% grant element, and it appears to be ODA. But then the question is, are those loans really concessional in character, as is also required by the ODA definition? <coughs> ODA definition says it must be concessional in character and bear a grant element of 25% measured at a 10% discount rate. Now... That question is not easy to answer, uh, and it has been the subject of controversy, including a scathing letter to the Financial Times by a former chair of the DAC, Richard Manning of the UK. Here's the letter, 9th of April, 2013. Uh, really fighting words here. Uh, shocking that the OECD should publish official statistics that make a mockery of its requirement that loans are concessional encouraging OECD finance ministries, treasury people, close your ears, uh, to get away with murder as they seek to massage reported aid upwards at minimum cost. And at the end, you see, he even 
brandishes a sword of Damocles over the DAC's 50-year mission to collect these data, the UN should take over the reporting if the OECD can't do a professional job. Well, um, on the last point, um, the UN would have quite a bit of difficulty taking over the job. They do have a big advantage with the new donors, the India and China and so on, uh, which are not in the OECD and don't necessarily accept the ODA definition. Uh, they may have a role in uh, encouraging those countries to report more openly on what they're doing in their aid program. But the current system for collecting aid data is very complicated and needs very close uh, liaison between whoever's collecting it centrally and the individual reporters in donor countries, and the OECD is really the ideal place for that. So I don't think that last thing is going to happen, but uh, you never know, I might get a package. Um, but real question is, uh, how much of a point has Mr Manning got? Are these loans really concessional or not? Uh, on the one hand, you could hardly call any profit-making activity concessional. You're borrowing at two and lending at three or three to five, uh, you're making a profit, that's not concessional, simple. But the countries who are doing it say, well, that's not the way, right way to look at it. Uh, the borrowing countries are uncredit worthy, they may not repay, and if they went out and tried to raise money themselves, they'd have to pay 10%. We give them a loan at 5%, they're getting a massive discount, that's concessional. So it really depends on your point of view. However, that second argument, there's a, a further wrinkle with debt relief. If a loan does go bad because the borrower was, was uncreditworthy and doesn't eventually pay back, then that loan is reportable as an ODA grant. It's turned into an ODA grant, the loan is cancelled, you get full ODA credit for the amount that you wrote off in that loan. So you could say that it would be double counting the risk to count all the loans as ODA on the basis that some of them might go bad, but then count every one that does go bad as ODA anyway. That's the, uh, the trick. Uh, so here is a graph where we're not counting the risk twice. Uh, we've been doing some work in Paris to see what ODA would look like or what a new measure of official development effort would look like if we only counted the risk once on the loans when the loans were given out, comparing them with a realistic discount rate for what the borrower would have to pay. Then we don't count any debt forgiveness afterwards. And we also don't count these domestic programs, students, refugees and so on. And as you see, it's nothing like the huge cut that ActionAid would recommend. Most countries, there isn't a large difference between the current net official uh, development assistance and official development effort measured as the funds for development that are external and at, calculated at a realistic discount rate. Now, a few countries, though, there is a substantial difference. Effort is considerably different from ODA, net ODA at present. And here are the countries with the biggest differences. Now, the difference is effort versus ODA. Is effort bigger or smaller than ODA? And you see two countries, it's bigger. Now, I know you're asking yourselves, how can this be? How can the effort be more than the net odour? Well, I have an explanation for you. Um, odour is measured net, and if you have a mature loan program, you are giving out, roughly, in new loans, what you are getting back in repayments on odour loans. So a long-standing aid program, uh, ODA loans program, will generate a net flow on ODA of roughly zero. And that's what's happened to Japan and Korea. They're getting a net flow of roughly zero on their ODA loans. However, their new loans are still concessional. They're at only usually 1% interest or even less. 
up to 40 years maturity, that's definitely a sacrifice. They may not get some of that money back at all and the interest rate is very low. And they have quite large aid programs, so that makes a big difference. Now, on the other hand, the countries uh, on the right-hand side that would lose uh, substantially if we move to a measure of budgetary effort, those countries are counting a substantial amount from the in-donor refugees and the students, whereas Japan and Korea are counting next to nothing and they have loan programs which are accelerating. They're getting bigger, which means that the outflows now, for a while, will be bigger than the reflows on old loans. So net odor, they're getting a positive trend on net odor for that. Here we see the extreme cases of France and Japan. Uh, France, as you saw on the previous slide, would lose the most on an effort measure. Japan would gain the most. And the reason for that is Japan, which are the lighter bars, has this mature aid program that is roughly the same every year, whereas France has a program where the loans have been going up and up, which means the grant element of their total odour is going down and down. They have, they're beginning an accelerating amount of loans at not very high concessionality. And that means that the overall grant element of their loans, if you take the grants plus the grant element in the loans, is falling sharply. And in the last two years, as you see, it's actually fallen under a DAC norm. There's a DAC recommendation, which is that ODA should bear a minimum grant element of 86% if you count the whole aid program. And France got into a fair bit of trouble in their recent peer review over breaking that norm twice running, and they're expected to get back to that norm in future. That will constrain their ability to boost their net odour by increasing the amount of loans. So I think your heads must be fair spinning by now, so I'll uh, briefly sum up. Uh, my conclusions are... Uh, odour levels will fall for several years. Uh, there will be fewer odour pledges, perhaps almost none. Australia, I know, already has a pledge after 2015. Um, there will be a new measure of total official finance for development, and it will probably be on the basis of gross flows, not net flows, ODA may remain the standard measure of donor aid, but it needs to be cleaned up to reflect real donor effort, and the OECD will continue to be the body that collects aid data, but probably with more involvement of the UN for the new donors like China and India. Now, all three issues we have looked at, the role of the DAC, the level of aid, and the definition of aid, have been really bound together from the beginning. For better or worse, neither ODA levels and targets nor the ODA definition would be are they, as they are today, but for the United States initiative in setting up the DAC and the DAC's role in subsequently encouraging and monitoring aid and in setting the rules for what is counted as aid. So I was going to finish with a slide of the sun setting on the Newbork Strand Hotel, but it turns out it's a bit of a mess out the back of that place, so I'm going to leave you with this peaceful slide while you think of your penetrating, in-depth questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. That was a really masterful survey in less than 40 minutes. Very impressive. Um, now, can I get a general indication of the number of questions, at least to the extent that they form in people's minds? Yeah, OK, well, we might take a few rounds of several questions rather than doing it one by one. Um, I have one, but I'm sure someone else is going to ask it, so I'll hold off. Um, should we start with Julia? Thanks, and uh, Simon, thank you. Having attended um, a few SLMs and HLMs uh, when I worked for Ose, I uh, appreciate the fact that you're probably the only person who can make that statistics both interesting and entertaining. So oh, thank you for that. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask about the status, I mean, two questions. Firstly, um, now working for an NGO, the DAC looks from the outside like the dogs judging the dog show. And so to what extent is there the opportunity for external influence on, on the DAC? Uh, 
and clearly that's part of why it's so difficult to shift some of the definitional work. Um, and then secondly, what is the status of the discussion on tied and untied aid and what is the DAC doing around it? And when you show the graphs, I think the DAC also publishes statistics on tied versus untied. And so where are the definitional issues on that? So I'd just be really interested in something like that. Thank you. Okay, a couple more. Um, if people could just say who they are. I'm Shane from Treasury. I've just got a real quick uh, curiosity question. When you were talking about Japan lending on at 1%, is that a real rate? Because they've been in deflation, is that like a nominal rate? So the concession concessionality based on the 10% discount rate, is that taking into account the inflation of the lending country? No, it's not. They're lending at one nominal, yeah. so their real rate is more than one. Yeah in periods where they're so in deflation. they're still getting a concession at, say, 9%, the difference between the 10% rate and their 1% they're lending on. Is that how it works? Uh, no, it's not. You work out the grant element, and if it's over 25%, then the whole loan is counted as ODA, and all the repayments are counted as ODA. The level of concessionality doesn't make right. any difference as long as it meets 25%, and in Japan's case, it's like 80 for some loans. You showed that the MDGs and the, uh, that period of time led to an increase in ODA. Um, right now, we're going through this whole sustainable development goal uh, process. What's to say that that won't lead to another increase? And what would be the pressures of uh, changing the ODA measures uh, in line with ideas of sustainability, uh, environmental mm -hmm. issues, and so on. Are we going to be seeing a lot of countries looking to convert uh, their environmental actions into statements of order? All right, why do you think those two, you've covered one? Right. Um, well, it is a bit like the dogs judging the dog show, um, but it's getting a lot less like that because first of all uh, there is much greater transparency in what is going on. Uh, that document that I showed you is one of many documents. You can find everything that I've said today on the internet without any trouble whereas ten years ago this would be a classified document, not very heavily classified but it would basically be an official document and you would have great difficulty as a non-official getting hold of that document. Another issue that is uh, coming up is that we have many uh, new donors joining the DAC and the DAC chair is very keen to open up also to donors outside the DAC and they don't necessarily accept the way this is done. Uh, however, the real pressure would only come, I think, from uh, civil society or the developing countries. And that means they would have to get on top of these technicalities, which they have a bit of trouble uh, getting on top of formulae and, you know, there are quite a lot of minutiae. And they also seem to have gone very quiet to me in recent years. There seemed to be a lot more noise a few years ago about this, uh, you know, real versus substandard aid, phantom aid and so on. In recent years, it's just uh, not so active. I wonder whether the... NGOs have become a bit uh, gongo type. You know what a gongo is? Yeah, you know, government operated sort of thing. They're so dependent on government funding uh, that it's a little bit, uh, they're a little bit embarrassed to make a lot of noise about it, or whether, um, yeah, it's also just a technical thing that they find it hard to get on top of. Now, tied and untied, um, the definitions of that haven't changed at all. Uh, tied aid is aid that must be spent in your own country. So it's uh, not giving as good value for money as aid that's put out on the international market and where the procurement is subject to competitive tendering and you get the best value for money. So the DAC has had this 50-year campaign to reduce tide aid. Uh, it's worked pretty well according to the figures. Share of tide aid is very high. Practically no aid to the least developed countries is tied. But if you dig into the figures, the reporting is a bit dodgy for a few countries. This is also no secret. Um, we've published 
the documents openly that show this and we are trying to tighten up but uh, of course with the budget pressures in donor countries it's going to be very difficult. But we do insist that the reporting ought to be there and that it ought to be accurate and we're making a push on that. Um, I think there probably will be another financing for development conference, if I had to guess, two years after 2015. But I think it's going to be not the same as last time, unfortunately. The fiscal situation is, looks as if it won't be anything like what it was in 2002 to 5 when things were going really well. Uh, plus aid is sort of coming down rather than already hit a, a floor. So I must say I'm not very uh, hopeful about uh, a revival in aid levels from that conference, if it comes. And the sustainable uh, development issues and whether people are double counting, they already are double counting. Anything that meets the ODA definition of developmental motivation is there and it's already counted, including lots of climate finance, for example. Even though in climate documents you see that climate finance is supposed to be separate from additional to and not reducing the amount of ODA, uh, interpretations of this vary such that whatever meets the ODA definition is counted as ODA. Now I don't know whether there might be some other measure, perhaps in this total official flows, that might take in things that are global environment concerns but aren't even <coughs> specifically directed at developing countries. That might be a separate thing, but I don't think the developing countries are going to give up on a measure of donor effort for development. I think that last point's particularly, I mean, the, the whole, the use of ODA for global public goods, including climate change mitigation, is in some people's mind another dodgy brother. Mm. I don't know how to justify what it is. Mm. All right, uh, up the back here. Uh, Chris Hoy from Oz I just had a quick question uh, because you have like the uh, generosity, I guess, index you could call it, whereby you rank the country based upon the percentage um, of GNI, and then uh, you sort of net it out, sort of if the way how the money was spent wasn't the best. Um, what, one thing which strikes me of doing that is that it's almost comparing each of the donors as if they're equal that each of the donors have quite varying sort of government debt situations, have very different uh, GNI per capita, even within the OECD. So I was wondering what work has done, has been done on that by the OECD about how donors themselves actually vary considerably and their ability to give. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi. Yeah, David Benz, I would I'll say it also. Um, my question is actually along a similar vein. Um, it seems that over a sort of number of decades, a lot of donors have gone from delivering ODA to focusing on poverty. That's sort of mm -hmm. one and the same thing, but it's like nuancing what that they, what they actually means. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's the potential for any um, introduction of a notion of poverty to explain the definition of ODA? Because it could have large implications for what's potentially counted, climate finance being a great example. Okay, one more. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Pryke from the Development Policy Centre. I was just wondering what the DAC was doing to try and reduce the lag time between uh, current, the current time and the, and the release of official development OECD statistics. So I think the lag's about, it's more than a year at present, and I was wondering what we can do to really make official reporting as real time as possible. Thank you. Right. Um, each donor's, ah, sorry. Each donor's uh, position is different. Yeah, that's definitely right. Um, also, each donor's government sector is of a different size, and some are almost twice as big as others. Uh, but, and the GNI per capita and so on, other measures the same. But it's not the OECD's business to uh, set aid targets. Countries take them on themselves, and the UN has set the benchmark. So we measure their performance, but we're not really, um, apart from the general idea of increasing the overall flow, we're not there to say that 0.7 is correct or, or that there should be some other adjustment for relative uh, prosperity and so on. Um, poverty rather than odour, I think the, uh, the time for that has passed. The, 
the real enthusiasm for poverty reduction being the be all and end all of ODA was eight to 12 or 15 years ago. There was a, um, a poverty marker uh, and at one that was proposed by the UK in our data and they gave it up after a few years because they said everything has to have a poverty objective or we won't do it. But in recent years they've come back from that and uh, you find that there are many things that are not directly targeting poverty and people say well every all development will eventually impact on poverty and so on. It might perhaps come back with this discussion in the UN about post-2015 goal for inequality or reducing inequality. I don't know. That's at a very early stage now and no one's quite sure inequality of what? Opportunity, results, freedoms, uh, so on. Um, timeliness of data. I have 2012 data for you and it's only July. Oh, you can come up later and I'll give you the uh, quite detailed data. But the really detailed data at project level is due on July the 15th and doesn't arrive from France, the United States and a few others until the end of November. And it's published within about three weeks. So we are in a constant uh, battle and so are the reporters from those countries to tr and others to try and make, get this in earlier. But you're right, should be, should be much earlier. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm Stephen House from here at the Development Policy Centre. I have two questions uh, after a very interesting presentation. I want to follow up on Jonathan's point. And what about these, uh, when you do your advance estimates, like for 2013, it's in terms of country programmable aid. I wonder why I use that rather than ODA, which is a key concept in other areas. And do you think, given your fairly gloomy prognosis, OECD is too optimistic in its CPA projections or forward estimates? And the second one was, you know, you said that the ODA concept needs to be cleaned up, but you didn't say how. Or, and we didn't get a sense there was any consensus. I did think on that, those loans, it's clear those aren't concessional in character, or at least they're no different from World Bank loans, which aren't IBRD, which aren't counted as ODA. So isn't that a clear area where it could be cleaned up, or what do you think uh, is that? Now, how to clean up ODA? Okay, a couple more. Yeah. Uh, Terry Henderson, just a general member of the community. Um, in the budget, deficit deliberations over the past year, the decision was made in Australia to take some money out of the development assistance and use it for take domestic care of refugees. Now, of course, we have the foreign minister saying they're not really refugees, they're economic migrants. But, um, well, the developments like this have an effect on uh, Australia's ODA or, or not, or is this just another way of chipping away at, at, at the concept? Uh, just on this question of cleaning up ODA, and thanks very much, Simon, for an excellent talk. Uh, Peter Callum, formerly with OTO. Um Security assistance, can you give us a sense of how much can be included in the, uh, the concept of ODA and, and, and what is still very much uh, left out, kept mm -hmm. out? Um, just uh, trying to get a sense of that. Okay, well, the reason we uh, project on CPA is because the projections for 2013, 2014, 2015 are designed to help developing countries plan their budgets. So they want to know how much money is going to be coming in. They're not so interested in the net flow, which ODA is usually presented net, and they're not interested in things like the in-donor refugee costs and uh, the student costs and so on. So that's all left out of CPA and we work on this gross flow that is likely to be available to some extent to the developing country to plan how they're going to use. Are we too optimistic? Well, uh, I don't no, we were planning to do a study about this, but this is as the countries actually report it. It's not our optimism. We, we send out a survey and we ask them what is the number and we don't adjust that number. Uh, I've been planning to look into it because it doesn't seem to predict odour all that well at the moment. Um, so, Given a lot of other people are interested in odour, even if recipients aren't, why don't you also ask for that data? Well, odour odor levels are not really as easy to predict either. Um, ODA has a lot of these uh, 
expenditures from other government departments. There could be debt relief come up that you don't know the timing that it's going to have. There are payments to multilateral institutions which tend to fluctuate rather wildly depending on what date people decide to lodge their promissory notes. So uh, I think given what CPA is there for and what the forward spending survey is there for, to inform developing countries of whether the trend is up or down in what they're likely to have at their disposal. I think it's fair enough to, to do it on CPA basis, but maybe you can hammer me at uh, lunch or, or whatever about that. Um, yeah. Uh, refugees, economic migrants and so on. Well, uh, yes. Um, this was the subject of some very energetic uh, exchanges in the recent peer review of Australia. I understand that 375 million is going to be booked for onshore refugees. Uh, we were asked whether the costs of detaining people offshore would be countable as ODA, and our answer was no. So I understand that's not being counted. Um, one thing to remember, though, is Although this thing is as leaky as a rusty sieve, uh, one thing is uh, firm, and that is you can only count the cost for the first 12 months of stay. So if ever this flow of whoever they are is uh, stanched, the amount countable will go down very quickly. Um, see a grim book from our Treasury colleagues about that one, but uh, <laughs> I don't know all the details of interdepartmental discussions about how it's counted and whatever, but it was obvious that $375 million had to be removed from what was planned to be spent in the rest of the aid program in order to accommodate this within a fixed amount that was in the budget for ODA. Um, security assistance, yes. Well, the line is holding reasonably well on that. Maybe there should be a broader measure that includes it all. At the moment, there's only 6% of the UN peacekeeping budget, which is a very large proportion of, uh, of um, the item that is countable as ODA, and nothing that's going to a developing country's armed forces is countable as ODA. All right, so there was a second part to Stephen's question around cleaning up. Ah, oh, yeah, I know that, but you're going to force me to answer it. Yeah, what was it again? <laughs> non concessional debt. Ah, whether this is really... Well, the Secretariat argued that these loans were not concessional. Uh, and that is also all up on the web. But we lost the argument. Uh, or, well, the DAC took it out of our hands and the DAC is going to judge whether these loans can be counted as ODA or not, and it looks as if they will be counted because they accept the rationale that it ought to be looked at from the borrower's point of view. Well, that's OK, I think, if you then don't count debt forgiveness. But debt forgiveness has added a huge amount in recent years. So as long as debt forgiveness goes, I think it's perhaps fair enough to count these loans as ODA. Remember also that... The net flow on ODA of any loan counted as ODA is zero in the long run because all the repayments must be deducted, the repayments of principal, not of interest. So while these countries are getting a boost at the moment, they are going to find it very difficult to keep up their ODA levels in years to come, and Japan has already found that. For the last 15 years, Japan has mostly had a negative net flow on loans each year because the repayments have exceeded what they can pump out the door. But then a supplementary on that, if that is the case, the DAC has deemed that these non-concessional loans would be countable, would that also not extend to the multilateral development banks? Well, the multilateral development banks, technically, their outflows don't count as ODA because it's only the funds they receive from the donor countries that are eligible to be counted as ODA. So it does imply that perhaps the distinction between concessional and non-concessional outflows would need to be re-looked at, but it wouldn't change ODA, because ODA is measured as how much goes in. Any more penetrating in-depth questions? <laughs> We're pretty much out of time, but if there are one or two more burning questions, please put your hands up. Uh, if people want to go and eat, we'll get back to work. So.
thank you very much. The session today has, has been filmed. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone noticed that, but uh, your incriminating comments have been recorded for posterity. Uh, please join with me in thanking Simon.